Hello, and welcome to Academy Unscripted. My name is John Huddlemeyer, and I'm the media specialist here at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Typically, I'm usually the one behind the camera, not in front of it. So this is a little bit of an experiment today. I'm here with Dr. Jason Wexstein, the Associate Curator of Ornithology at the Academy and Associate Professor in the Bees Department over at Drexel. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. So can you start by telling us uh, what exactly is it that you do at the Academy of Natural Sciences? So I'm Curator of Ornithology, and the Ornithology collections at the Academy are among the oldest collections of bird specimens in the world, and among the most important as well. And the work that I do involves both studying birds and studying parasites of those birds. So I'm an ornithologist and I'm also a parasitologist. I like to call myself an ornitho-parasitologist because I do both sorts of work. So for like people, like people at home, like a way to talk about it is kind of like you're studying like lice found on birds. Yes, yeah. So basically these lice live on the feathers and under the feathers of birds. So any given bird, like an American robin that's hopping around on your lawn, that can have four or five species of lice found on it. Most of these lice are not feeding on blood. Some do, but most are feeding on actual feathers, which is a pretty weird, weird thing to eat. So there's all this really cool, we call it coevolution between the parasites and the host. What other kind of projects are you working on right now? We're studying a bunch of different groups of birds. So um, one of my PhD students is working on a group of birds called nightingale thrushes. Another one that I think is kind of interesting is we're studying a group of hawks called excipiters. And these are like things like sharpshin hawk and cooper's hawk here in Philadelphia. And it turns out that if you, if you look at a whole bunch of specimens of these things, there are lots of different forms. These different subspecies look different. They have different measurements. They have different color patterns. And we wanted to ask the question, are they genetically different? So are these forms on the islands, on, the, on Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Hispaniola, are they genetically different than the North American ones and the neotropical ones? It turns out they're not genetically connected. We know that we've sequenced thousands of genes now, and we know that the island forms are different. And from a conservation perspective, that's important because in Puerto Rico, the population has always been very low for these Puerto Rican sharpshin hawks we know that this is an endangered population and actually we would actually call it a species almost certainly based on the analyses that we've done. Any surprises that you've like come across in your work? So a couple months ago I got an email from San Diego Zoo. They have California condors in captivity and they, they raise them to reintroduce them to the wild. So they had found a louse on a California condor, at least what they thought was a louse. And so I said, well, how many legs does it have? You know, and they said it has six legs. So I knew if it had six legs, it's an insect. So I said, okay, that's good. Send it to me. And the reason this is kind of interesting is that when California condors were brought into captivity, the veterinarians actually treated them with pyrethrum powder, which is like flea powder to kill all the ectoparasites on these birds. But remember, these birds are endangered and a lot of birds have parasites that are specific to them. So it turns out that California condors had a louse that's endemic to California condor that's only found on California condor. And basically that means that it's co-endangered, right? There is there is a louse that's found on an endangered bird. That means the louse is almost certainly endangered, right? So in the literature, we've all, there's always been this story that, that basically this louse was rendered extinct. And you know, that, that when the veterinarians treated the birds, they actually caused an extinction event. Bottom line is they sent me this thing, put it under the scope, and it was a colpocephalum. We sequenced DNA from it. We put that into one of these evolutionary genealogies, these evolutionary trees. So it's, it turns out it's this, it's this thought to be extinct louse. So the louse isn't extinct. So we rediscovered an extinct louse. I mentioned earlier that I'm normally the one that's behind the camera. One thing that I've been doing a lot has been taking pictures of birds. I want to chat with you a little bit about that and like birding culture in general, because I feel like the last couple of years, I feel like there's been an uptick in people just trying to be outside and... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a passionate hobby. I mean, an obsession even. I mean, and, and you know, I'm a scientist, but I am also a crazy birder. And I carry my big DSLR with a 400 millimeter lens and take pictures of birds. So I, I enjoy doing that too. And there are great groups here in Philly. So we have, um, we have Delaware Valley Ornithological Club and that group of people is out and there are all kinds of cool WhatsApp groups, letting people know like what rarities are showing up. Like I know this morning, like a whole bunch of migrants came in because people are reporting what they're seeing out there. So I like to take pictures, right, of, of birds. And I have uh, my camera set up next to window most of the time for when I'm working. Is it a bad idea to keep bird feeders that close to windows? You know, I mean, windows kill birds, right? We know mm -hmm. that windows kill birds. The reality is your house window probably is not the biggest killer of birds. It's going to be big buildings with lights on at night. I've noticed this one and only this, this one has been creeping in my windows all the time. And I was even out like mulching the other day and 
the same one jumped, was looking into my wife and I's car windows. Does that make any sense? Is that like, is well, that maybe it's, maybe it's seeing its reflection. I mean, that could be what's going on. I mean, sometimes it's because they're picking up insects off of the windows or something like that. So, so this is a brown headed cowbird and it's a female. And the interesting thing is these things really aren't territorial. They don't actually even make nests. You know, you'll actually see the females looking for nests that she can lay her eggs in. And it, they lay their eggs in all kinds of other birds' nests. So you'll sometimes see these little teeny warblers or chipping sparrows feeding this giant chick. And that's a cowbird chick. You know, I don't think it's, you know, it's not a territorial defense, but maybe they do try to chase other females off. Do you have any techniques or advice for amateur uh, photographers who want to, you know, get shots of birds? Learn about the birds that you are interested in photographing. So, you know, the more you know about natural history, the easier it's going to be to get close to them, the easier it's going to be to detect them. Like when I'm out, a lot of times I'm hearing the bird before I even see it. All right. So now we're going to move into the lightning round. Uh, we're going to start with a couple questions like, what is your favorite word? Whackadoodle. Okay, so how about the opposite of that? What's your least favorite word? No. Uh, what excites you creatively or emotionally? Well, I mean, I, I love being outside. I love nature. And my job, fortunately, gets me out into nature. And I love doing science. So, you know, every day I get to ask fun questions, whether I'm in a class with students or in the lab or out in the field. What turns you off? I think people that do not have any empathy for other people. What profession other than your own would you like to have? You know, if it was just for fun, you know, like an outdoor fishing guide or, you know, something like that. But the reality is my job is like pretty much my dream job. What profession would you not like to do? Anything where I'm stuck in an office all the time. If you could be another animal or plant for a day, what would you choose? Oh, I think something like a harpy eagle. You know, it's like the top dog. It eats sloths and monkeys, and they're just amazing flyers. I mean, they're epic birds. What's your motto? Have fun. What is the most wondrous thing in the natural world to you? Flying over huge tracts of wilderness is always an impressive sight. Well, that completes the lightning round. Uh, I want to thank you, Jason, for joining us today, and I want to thank the viewer for jumping in uh, and hanging out with us for a little bit. This has been another edition of Academy Unscripted.